Well, thank you for everybody for um, you know joining me today to share how we use our applications to make better tasting coffee. Uh, my name is Jeff Stagg. Um, I work for Jakob Dowie Egberts, a, a company that has been um, or come together very recently. Dowie Egberts um, was in existence for a long time and it merged with the um, craft or model lease side of the coffee business there to um, form a large uh, coffee company. Um, these are applications come from me and the model lease side. Um, we're currently trying to integrate them into the way the whole company works. Um, th this, th this morning, um, Helen was using uh, our applications to uh, identify sources of disease, prevent or reduce crime uh, rate, um, prevent terrorism. Um, well, this is nothing quite like that. I'd like to think, though, that if she's going to be that busy, she'd enjoy the old cup of coffee. And our applications are being used to make good, great tasting coffee, too. So it just shows how diverse R is. Okay, so if I go on to the next page. Um, I'm here to talk about two R applications, Constrained Dual Scaling, written this year, still in a proofing stage, really, and the Rose Coffee Blend Generator uh, in 2013. Both of these applications were um, done or developed in consultation with uh, Mango Solutions as our consultants and, and writing the R scripts. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, attempt anyway to go through a case study and I will demonstrate these applications live. I've not seen anybody do that, so, and I know it's fraught with danger, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so the case study I'm going to go through is um, how do we go about, in JDE, developing better tasting coffees, uh, one that satisfies co the consumer and also meets the business requirements, which of course is uh, an important requirement. Um, that means manufactured out of the right site, to the right cost and quality targets that we set for it. Okay. Uh, so the objective of the first part is um, satisfying the consumer, and it's where I'll demonstrate the constrained, constrained dual scaling application. We're going to run a, a consumer test to measure the effectiveness of our product um, versus key competitors and potential quality improvement prototypes. Um, it says at the top there that in this scenario our product is underperforming the market. This is just a scenario. It actually in reality doesn't happen. Um, JDE products or the prototypes that we're making and testing here, they come from two main factories in the same company but two factories with very different roasters. Um, and the current product um, is from factory A and the final product that we take and launch must come from Factory A. Um, the consumer test that we run is a, a standard type of consumer test for us. It's going to test the broad range of uh, coffee products uh, versus the competitor. It's done in a central location test. This test was uh, 10 products. And uh, all the consumers see all the products. Um, they're using a balanced sequential monadic rotation design we run it in two sessions uh, over two days, um, five products per session. And what we get from the consumers is their liking scores on a nine point scale. It can be overall liking, um, appearance or taste overall, or, or aroma liking, um, crema liking, all those types of things. We got a lot of other attributes as well, but I'm focusing on liking scores in this presentation. Um, the CDS application, um, constrained your scaling doesn't mean a lot, but essentially what it's trying to do is to identify consumer bias in the use of their scale. They use scales differently. Um, we can identify different response styles. Um, I don't know if you can read it there, but it's acquiescent, disacquiescent, midpoint, and extreme. And they follow the sorts of distribution scores um, that you can see on those graphs. Um, Clearly acquiescent are people that are very positive about all the products. Uh, disacquiescent, the, the, the reverse. A midpoint, probably 
person like me, a scientist, who starts in the middle and then starts working either way based on does, do I think things are better or not? And then you probably get somebody in extreme. I might guess they might be extrovert. So it's a love it or hate it, Marmite type of thing. Okay, but the interesting thing for us is that we know this exists. Uh, the scoring bias uh, introduced by the consumers um, with different preferences um, can have a consequence in the results in, um, in, in how we interpret them. Um, so what we need to do is to try and remove that bias and we're using the CDS algorithm um, to reduce the bias. Notice I didn't say uh, take it out, I can only reduce it. Okay. Um, the CDS demo, um, it's the CDS application itself is an R script, um, as I say, help, developed uh, by Mondelez at the time and Mango. And it's part of what we call um, the JDE Consumer Test Evaluation Tool, which is a jump control, um, uh, software program of customized scripts. Um, so I will show how jump um, is calling um, R and then taking the feedback from R and converting it back into jump um, with this live demonstration. Um, first of all, before I go, try to go live, I'll show you the outline of the script. I don't think you need to read this too much, but essentially what it's saying is um, some R script at the top takes the data. Um, sorry, the jump, jump script at the top takes the data. The bit in red converts it into R format. It's then run through the ICDS uh, run function. The data comes back from R and then is converted back into jump script for further processing. And the, you can see the function call here, I, ICDS run, is the um, part. Are you seeing that? No, you're not. Okay. In the middle there, I, ICDS run is, is the actual CDS application written in R. Um, DT is the data file, K is the number of groups we, we want to find, and transform is something set for us to uh, rescale the ba data back to the original global average and uh, standard deviation. We can turn that off as true or false. Oops, I didn't want to show you that. Let's try to go to a demo. I believe we should go to the R. In R, um, it can be run through the MCT package. It's actually multi-product consumer testing. And you can see the dual scaling application. I won't run it there because uh, you won't see the script. So I'll op open the script, which is here. And that, say again? Ah, sorry, beg your pardon, uh, function F4. Bad eyesight and poor lighting. Uh, function F4. Just shows you I'm not looking at the screens. Is that okay? Yeah. So this is the script that we're seeing uh, that we went through before. If I run the script, um, it's asking me for the input file and it's called test data set. And in that data set, we have the consumer ID, um, the product code that's being um, evaluated, and some liking stores for each of the consumers. So three scores per product, and number one is the consumer, and we have about 300 consumers or whatever it was, and there's the second consumer starting there, for those products. So if I now just say import the data, that will automatically run the CDS um, script, and within a matter of uh, a few seconds, we get the output. Jumpers um, still has the input file that we've read in, in that format. In the output file, we have, if I blow it up, the data of the product code and the consumer ID from the original data set, but now we have the CDS converted scores. We have the group that it was assigned to and what style it was. And then over on the right hand side, we have the original data. Okay, so um, if I do that and we just run the MCT tool, what I have is a before and after now. I have the original data and um, the uh, rescaled data based on the CDS algorithm. So if I 
use a way of testing or comparing those two, which is a customized script in Jump. I can open the adjusted scores file um, and feed it the overall liking, which was the original data, and the CDS, which is the converted, and compare the results. And then you get a little graph up, and uh, I won't go into that there because if I can now go back to the PowerPoint file, and I've not lost my place, and blow that up, that is the same. Uh, yes, the same graphic as we have of, uh, uh, that I produced with the script. And the interesting thing here is that um, when we're looking at the data, we have factory B products. Um, in red, the current product's blue, uh, that's factory A, and the green are prototypes from factory A. So here we have factory B products that are outperforming our current product and the rest of factory A. And we know that from a, a standard range test, it's uh, anything connected to uh, by a bar is uh, significant, uh, it, you know, it's parity and anything outside of that it's significantly better. So here we have the top two and the competitor being significantly different. This is the actual score. What's interesting is that prototype two actually outperforms one in the actual scores by not a significant difference, but about 0.1. Um, when the CDS algorithm is run, um, the prototype one now outperforms prototype two, still statistical parity, but now um, prototype one is indicated to be superior or significantly better the, the, than the competitor as well as the current product. So um, what we've seen here is we have a tied rank, we have a, a choice uh, between two here of what we might want to take forward for further testing. Um, the CDS algorithm is run, some bias is taken out due to the use of scale and now it indicates that perhaps one is better than the other due to the fact that uh, number prototype one is predicted to be better than the competitor as well as our own. And it is a, a reversal of the scores. So we, if we just went forward with the actual results, we might be going into picking the top performing product as in highest scored when after CDS that choice is changed. Okay, so that's the CDS algorithm. Um, reducing the bias through to user scale and altering a decision about a product that we might take forward to launch. Um, there's one issue with this as it's put in red at the bottom. The winning product is actually produced out of the wrong factory. So now I shall go in and demonstrate the second R application. And this is the roast coffee blend generator. Um, this has been around for a lot longer. Um, I can't say a great deal about it, and I shouldn't show too much of it either, um, but I will show some. Uh, the um, objective now is that we have a winning design, um, but we have to need something manufactured out of factory A that would be a flavour match to it, and it's cost optimised. Okay, so I'm going to use the blend generator application to do that. So what is the blend generator? A chemistry-based modelling system. Um, that predicts roast coffee blends that are sensory equivalent to a target blend, um, but also mis uh, meet the business uh, and design constraints that we want to impose on it. Uh, the roast coffee blends are generated through simulation um, and Monte Carlo, um, using a library of uh, roast coffee components, and uh, I'll show you that in a moment. Um, the library components uh, cover a broad range of um, bean origins and different processing and if it's dangerous to keep coming out of this but uh, if I escape out of this I dare say I'm gonna have to use function f4 again I'll show you the yeah I'll show you the um, input file to the blend generator um, as an excel file here yep. you can see that um, it's blinded it says aroma 1 aroma 2 because we're not prepared to share that with you um, interestingly, I said we merged with um, and became Jakob's Dowie Egberts. We had a different colour measurement in the two companies, so this database has both. It's a roast colour measure, titrated facility and, and the cost of the bean. But here you can see that there are different bean types, 
um, Bs, B, B2s, C2s. They have they have real names, but I can't show you them. And um, here's the component name as a label that's unique that will be used to actually uh, be simulated uh, into blends. The target that we want to match is put in at the top, and the components are then um, computed to how they differ from that target. Okay, so i try to go back to my presentation. Um, the uh, computed aroma profiles for the simulated blend are then tested um, for their fit versus the target. Um, and this is done by the blend generator fit value. It's a measure of difference of the aroma profile of the simulated blend versus the target blend. Yeah, a zero value is a perfect match to the target. Uh, the higher the number, the further away and less likely it is to be sensory equivalent. Um, we had a, a historical library of um, blends that have passed um, equivalency testing. We were able to compute fit values for those and come up with what we believe was a fit value that would be safe as a pass to sensory equivalency and an opportunity value. And this is around 80 for safe and 140. So this is like a, a measure of difference from the target profile. So now I'll do a, a live demonstration of the R application of the blend generator. Um, the objective here um, is remember we're trying to make factory B product out of factory A. So I'm going to use the factory B target, the winning design from the consumer test, and I'm using the component library from factory A to see if I can match it. And I'm going to impose constraints that are have a fit value of 120, which is uh, a, a sort of a number that includes some opportunity. The cost of the winning design out of the factory B um, was 4.55, and that can be dollars per kilo or euros or whatever, but it's just 4.55 <coughs> units. But ideally, um, the original blend out of factory A was 4.4, so it'd be good if I could find something sensory equivalent to B uh, to the winning design from factory B, but actually cost the same price as the original. So that'll be my task. Okay, it says live demonstration. Well, it takes time to come out of this. And let's shut that down. Yeah, I can close that library now. Okay, I can close jump down. Sorry about this, you're seeing the workings of... Uh... We've lost it again, have we? Good. <laughs> I'm just shutting everything down and exit jump. So I've told you what I did. Now what I will do is um, function F4, bring it back up again hopefully. Yep, and here we have dual scaling and the blend generator, our application. I shall now run that. Okay, this is it. So the first thing you do, and the way it's set up, um, it was a good application. It was got even better once Mango got hold of it. So uh, I'm importing the data. Um, it should actually default to the directory I want to use, which it did. And this time I'm inputting alternative sorting, factory B to factory A, just open it up. And I can use the default settings on here because it's easier. I've just, and that's input, imported the data. Now, what I'd like to point out is here, the project log, this records every action I do. And over here on the blender are the options I have under the blend generator, and they become live as and when I've got to the correct stage, so I can't select anything beyond what I'm able to do. So now I'm gonna subset the data. So I've imported everything. This allows me to subset things. Um, in this case, all I need to do is to f select the first chemical. Now I could create new groups and do all sorts of things, but it takes time. Uh, I can only show, show you a small fraction of the software, okay? But um, it still should be quite powerful. So I now go into simulation. I said I use simulation. 
I typically use a you know, quarter of a million or something. Oh, depends on the library, how many components I'm using in the simulation, how many uh, components there are, what can be within each blend. I'm going to generate blends with three components only, and I'm going to actually set them as increments of five, so they can exist, as, exist in the blend as five, ten, fifteen, not two or something. So it's uh, working on integers. Okay, so I've done that now. I'm going to simulate. I think this takes about 10 seconds. Uh, so we've probably got time for it. And what we did do was uh, we added a nice um, window that says done on it. It's because people can press buttons when they shouldn't. Okay. So now in the project log, yeah, I lost it, didn't I? Yeah, I think it, it is there, it just disappears. So in there, what I've done is simulated 50,000 rows. It's recorded that, an increment step in the blend of five. Um, it's only got 41,000 and just over unique blends because 8,000 8, or nearly 9,000 were replicated in the, in the simulation. I now do constraints overlay on the uh, simulation. The simulation has really simulated the entire space. I'm in interested in a certain business area of that for a certain cost and fit. So I will Im impose the constraints on it now. And I mentioned that the fit value I would impose is 120 and the cost was 4.55 of the factory component B. Okay, although ideally I'm looking for 4.4. So if I just let that run, I can impose many other constraints, but we won't do that for this demo. There's 119 blends that fit that criteria. If I now go into the graphical visualization, I'll set the clustering on. This, uh, this clusters the CAC profiles, as we call them, key aroma compound profiles, um, in terms of how they differ from each other, uh, which helps us select candidates. And I can do a, um, a selection. Here, are the, this is a a, blend, a file that contains the simulated blends that met the criteria and I can plot in the spider any number of those but I think it said there was 119 so if I go down here you'll see there's 119 okay blends I'll pick the top one just for the demo and uh, once I've done that move that down there and just say okay and we get a spider plot the blue is the ideal profile in other words it would match the target ideally, so we know that certain aroma compounds are significantly over and some significantly under. Um, we, may, we may or may know, may, we may or may not know the relevance of some of these, so that helps in the process of selection. I had 119 blends that that met my criteria. Um, this is the minimal, the one with the least fit and cost of 4.4. Interestingly, okay, and. More powerfully, I think, is this plot, which is the 119 solutions put on a, a plot that shows cost up one side and fit across the other. And you can play trade-offs here. And if I want to, something around 4.4, this blend here is, is very near ideal, the current price, and is quite a low fit. So that looks to be, in this particular run, my best blend option, and I think that's what I plotted. Okay. So that's... Uh, essentially the blend generator. The, I'll m sh move this aside. I'll show you that there is an optimizer. The optimizer tells us what best actually can be achieved under the same constraints. And there's what-if scenarios you can do under optimization um, as well to optimize either the global optimum or uh, to optimize a simulated blend further if it's possible. Remember simulation will not cover all designs, only some of them. So we can work on that optimizer. Typically though, when we find out what the global optimum is, it's very rarely we, ad we adopt it. The reason we don't adopt it is because it's not always as practical for the factories to make that blend as some of the others that we select. Okay, but it's very important for us to know what the absolute best option you could get for cost or fit is and then understand the trade-off that we're making through the selection of other candidates that we've simulated. Okay, so if I shut this down. Yeah, it's not working. 
to go that on. Fine. Quit. Well, I should have said also that any work that we can do um, is being the log is being. Um, I'll just cancel that for the moment. The log is completely up to date in every step I took here. When I use another application, which is to store any file away to Excel, the original data all the way through to the data I've just produced through the clustering procedure. Um, when I do that, the, the log is stored with it. So you, have a, you know how you produced it as a record. Cancel that. When you come here, um, in this part, you can actually save where you are with any project. Um, when I quit, I can save that project where I am and come back to it, but I won't do that. And then I come back to the demo and try and finish off for today. Um, do we have that? Yep. So if I blow that back up again, that's roughly what we produced um, today when we ran. There's a, a blend design here um, that was uh, very close um, to the uh, target um, in terms of fit. And it was just over what we call safe, but still well within opportunity. And the cost was around about 4.4. A simulated blend that I ran last time when I did the presentation was slightly lower cost, but slightly over the fit value I think we produced this time. And it has a very similar profile in terms of the chemicals it's missing on. The last stage of what we would do um, is the validation side. So, of course, um, we've, we've had to select a blend from uh, 119 candidates in this case. That would be done by expert assessments based on their knowledge of the process and the factory. And also sensory validation, so expert tasters and uh, we'd actually do some informal tasting to make sure that what we're selecting makes some kind of sense. We then put it through a much more informal tasting process, which is a sensory equivalency test. Here we'd be testing the, the blend that we selected from factory A versus the winning design, factory B, uh, to make sure that they were sensory equivalent. Um, the next part would be, as we... Um, want to launch a product that is better in the market, we need to do that test. Um, so we go back to the consumer, we take the new blend uh, that we produce in factory A versus the current product, which is manufactured in uh, the same factory, and then we actually get a head-to-head -head comparison of performance to make sure that the new blend is better to rectify the initial problem, which is the fact that we were underperforming in the market. And then we would, once we've launched it, we just monitor the market performance and any consumer complaints. And that's it. <laughs>